Hello, hello. I said good morning. What time is it there? If it's if it's if it's morning. It's late night here. It's like 11:01 p.m. Or I guess 23. So y'all are just starting your day then. Happy Friday for those of you just starting your day. One PM in Malaysia? Or thirteen hundred in Malaysia? Nice. One PM in the Philippines. Oh Hello my Pinoy Bess. <laughs> I love the Philippines. Lived there for like four I'd live there. I would I would live there. Like permanently. <laughs> Come to Morocco. It's on my list. I don't know how many places I'll be able to make it to in my lifetime, but I definitely have a list of a lot of them. Hi. Will I go to Egypt? I have a lot of people in Cairo asking me to visit Egypt. It's on my list, I might. Walaikum salam. Am I from Sudan? No. I am from America, United States of America. It's 5.03 a.m. in the UK. What are you doing up so early? Oh my good. Well, I guess that would be acid, right? For y'all. Hey. Or f Fajr. Why'd I say acid? Oh my goodness. Fajr. Morocco's coming through. I see a lot of people from Morocco and Malaysia. So I think, cause I, I took a look at my analytics um, the other day to see where my where all of my followers are from. And like at the very top is, other than the United States is Egypt. And then I think after Egypt is Malaysia. So. Oh, hello. Yeah. Nice. Yemen. The whole world's showing up in here. <laughs> it's amazing. Callie's in the house. Philly. Excellent. So what is ever is so what's everyone doing awake? Because it's either super early. <laughs> Some of y'all are getting ready for work and like if you're if it's the morning time, but for everybody who's where it's late night, just couldn't sleep. Was I considering other religions? prior to converting no i genuinely did not think that i would join any religion to be honest um i was always fascinated with religions i always liked studying religions but i didn't actually think any of them would actually i said actually twice but i didn't think any of them would would actually get me to convert so this is just as much of a surprise as it is for everyone else it was unexpected for sure do i support a two-state solution what, what was that in reference to what do you mean
Oh, thank you. Oh, Palestine. So you're you're saying a two state solution, but like Palestine has their own state, Israel has their own state, just independently. I mean, if they do come up with a two a two state solution, more would have to happen on top of that. Palestinians would need reparations for everything that was destroyed, and for the years and years and years of post-traumatic stress that they're, they're going to have to go through. Thousands of Palestinians are permanently disabled. Some have injuries. I was just watching a, a just heartbreaking video today of a, a little toddler that, that had to have both legs amputated. Before that, the, before that baby could even live life or, or understand life as even a concept, that baby's disabled and has to live the rest the the rest of their life without legs. So, and that's just one instance. That's not counting the thousands and thousands of other instances. So, if there is going to be a two state solution, they it can't just be, oh, you have your land, we have ours, because you destroyed most of that land. It's going to take their money. So first of all, you, you, you have been controlling those resources for years and years and years and years. So those, the resources have been controlled. Um, having their own, the Palestinians having their uh, own independence and, and their own way of making money has been prevented or even attacked. Um, there's, just, there's just so much permanent damage that has been made that in order for a two-state solution to happen, Israel would have to pay a, like, money can't even do it. Like, it, it, it has to go so far beyond that. They would have to uh, provide free, uh, met, like, just free medical care for, for indefinitely, for, for life and for every generation to come they would have to um like i said pay reparations they they would they would actually have to provide um fertile land it can't just be the rubble that they just say okay have at it here's your land that that also wouldn't be fair so they would have to also provide fertile land where palestinians would be able to grow their own crops make their own money they destroyed how many olive trees that take 30, 40 years to grow, like years and years and years to grow to their full height, they've destroyed them. And that was another source of income. That is going to take a half a lifetime to recover as far as that's concerned. The older generation that w will, will die off before that ever happens. So that those are reparations that you cannot possibly make up. So there just is so many factors that have to go into a two state solution because it can't just be like, OK, um, everything stops now. We'll take we'll take our side. You take yours because this side has all the wealth there. There's been no struck like extensive structural damage to this side you still have your businesses you still have your wealth you still have medic you, you still have medical care you still have water you still have food you, you have everything and if you were to stop today and just give palestinians what they have they would they would have to build from the ground up which would take lifetimes lifetimes and that's not including the mental and emotional damage that is is going to be constant this is permanent trauma that they've experienced. So. Hello. I doubt that will be the plan. Listen, it, 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 Palestine deserves freedom no matter what. The damage that has already been done is unforgivable. 
It's unforgivable. It's 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 not <laughs> reparations is it, like true reparations, true making reparations for everything that has been lost is impossible at this point. It's impossible. Whole entire family family lines, entire bloodlines have been wiped out. Whole entire families will no longer exist. I mean, they're alive and in Jana, alhamdulillah. But I'm just saying, here, entire bloodlines have been have been completely obliterated. Reparation reparations can't make up for that. Who are you going to pay the reparations to? The family's gone. You completely destroyed them. So it's it's. It's just so it's it's a tragedy that I never thought that I would see in my lifetime. Um, I never thought that. Well, yes, I did. Yes, I did. I was going to say I never thought that my country would be responsible for such a thing or backing such a thing. But America has always done that. <laughs> the United States has always backed such atrocities. So that's it's not something that's new in the United States. Hold on. Somebody just said, I love Israel. You're going to get blocked immediately. Hold on. That is completely unacceptable. There we go. How disgusting. We're talking about the genocide of thousands of people and you have the audacity to come in here and say, I love Israel. How disgusting. I've already read the letter of bin Laden. How did my work react to the hijab? Business as usual. <laughs> they li they literally didn't blink an eye. They were just like, oh, <laughs> you know. But, but oh, thank you all so much for the just the wonderful words and support. <laughs> How did my family react? They were very supportive and loving. I've been very blessed. I've been very blessed and very lucky. M most, m or all, all of the people in my life have been nothing but supportive. I haven't gotten a single friend or family member that, is set, that, have, that has not been supportive or have asked me what am I doing or, or why or anything like that. They, they've all congratulated me and said how proud they were of me. Exactly, alhamdulillah. You know, how do I feel wearing hijabs? You know, because those who have followed me for a while, you know, I'm autistic. You know, I have autism. Um, and it's very comforting. It's very comforting. I made a video prior, like when I first, when I first started wearing the hijab, I said that um, I would probably try and find something similar even if I did, didn't revert to Islam because it, it it is very very comforting I don't know if it's just because um it just makes me feel safe or or it just it I don't know it, it just feels like a safety blanket sort of like so it's I love it it's very comforting to me it calms me down Someone said I'm not autistic. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, 
somebody said Mal something about Malcolm X's legacy. Do you feel like Malcolm X's legacy is not celebrated enough due to his Islamic faith? That's a good question. That's an excellent question. Um, I think it's a mixture of sorts. I think that the reason why, why Martin Luther King is raised so, so far above Malcolm X is um, Dr. King was more of the peaceful version, even though that's a common misconception. Malcolm X is known for the phrase by any means necessary, like freedom by any means necessary. Like we will do what we have to do, whether that be violent or not. And so I think that painted him for people outside of the black community that painted him as, as more of a, a violent person or, or a terrorist, whereas he was responding directly to oppression. And um, he believed in defending ourselves. And I, I think that that's the only reason why he, it, or and him being Muslim as well, I do think that is a factor for sure. Um, but I think most of his, most of the reason why he's not held as as to high of a as as high of a standard to to Dr. King is because he he felt that that freedom should not be begged for freedom should should not be um if 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 the oppressor is oppressing us we should not react by just being nice <laughs> if, if they're if the oppressor is taking our freedom we need to take it back like that's that that was more his toward the end of his life um he was more leaning toward dr king's beliefs it was after his uh pilgrimage to mecca he came back with a much a far more peaceful state of mind but we we unfortunately didn't get to see that part of his life unfold and blossom because he was assassinated. When will I visit Mecca? Um, hopefully sometime next year, I hope. We'll see. Travel is definitely expensive <laughs> on that side of the world, so we'll see. We'll see how, how good I am at saving money to travel. How do I feel spiritually after reverting? That's also a good question. I feel, at first I felt just incredibly peaceful. More peace than I've ever felt in my entire life. And now I'm studying and, and just really diving in. And uh, I feel a bit, um, Conflicted isn't the word. Uh, I just have a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn. Um, and that can be overwhelming at times because I also have a lot of work to do. Not not my day job. I'm, I'm talking about activism wise. I have a lot of work to do. And just in raising awareness and battling the misconceptions of Islam, I have a lot of work to do. And so the balance of everything is very difficult. Um, working a full-time job, finding the time for my faith and reading the Quran, studying, um, while also keeping up with everything going on around the world, not not e not even just with Gaza, although Gaza takes uh, top priority because it's it's at the highest risk of being completely destroyed and a whole entire population of people of being completely wiped out. It's it's the second Nakba. Um, 
so Gaza takes high, highest priority, of course, but just learning about the different genocides happening around the world and conflicts and, and everything like that, because now that I have a larger platform than what I started with, it's very important that I use my platform wisely. And I, I like to keep things lighthearted. I joke around with you guys a lot, but in reality, after those little one minute videos where I'm just being kind of, you know, fun and, and, and um, bubbly, I the camera goes off and I get back to work and it's very um, heavy. It's very heavy. There's a lot of crying. <laughs> There's a lot of um, just heartbreak and, and just seeing what's going on. There's a lot of planning. Just what am I going to do as, as a human being that wants to help everyone. This this is by far the biggest test that I've faced so far in my life. And I've gone through quite a few things um, um, in my life, but this is, I've always been an activist for, well, for 17 years, I've been an activist since I was 17 years old. And I've talked to senators face to face. I've marched. I have protested. Everything that an activist could possibly do, I've done. But I did not have the audience that I have now. I do not have the reach that I have now. So all of my actions prior would touch maybe this much, would make maybe this much of a difference. It was still important, don't get me wrong, and I put all my energy into it, but it made about this much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. This is the first time that my actions could make this much of a difference. And I, am, I suddenly have to worry about everything that I say. Um, you, there's less room for being a flawed human being and maybe saying things wrong. Uh, because I keep in mind, I'm not just representing myself. Now I'm a direct representation of the Muslim community. I'm not saying I'm the only representation, but I'm just saying for non-Muslims who follow me or, or are getting um, uh, exposed to the to Islam for the very first time by watching me, that's that is a very heavy responsibility that I don't take lightly. So I try to make sure that I'm doing Islam justice, but. It's like I said, it's a it's a balancing act because um, balancing that with autism, uh, it can get very overwhelming. And I have to make sure that I'm still taking little breaks because this is what happens. If I don't take breaks or if I don't rest, um, something very scary happens. If you're not familiar with autism, it's called an autistic meltdown. And it's different for, for everyone, but for me, I lose my words. I just lose them. I can't speak. Um, I also can't move. It, it's completely paralyzing. And so it's, the, it's, I've had so many of them, but they get more and more terrifying every time. And so I'm, and it, there's no warning prior. There's there's no like, oh, okay, I need to slow down because this is what's happening. It happens like that. So it's it's not as if it's it's preventable, but it it there is less of a chance of it happening if I do um, check the moments when I'm feeling overwhelmed and just kind of calm down. So if there are ever lulls in my posting. Like if I, if I take a couple days and I haven't posted anything, 
please know it's not that I care less about any of these causes. It's not that I um, am less passionate or anything. I have to remain strong because the fight is lifelong, right? Activism is lifelong. It isn't as if I just have to make it through this point in time and, and drive awareness in this short point in time and I'm done. This is going to last for the rest of my life, however long Allah um, wants me here. This is the direct path Allah has put me on, is, is fighting for my fellow human beings, regardless of where they are. Um, so, you know, that that's just, it's a lot. <laughs> And it happened in a, in a relatively very short period of time. It's been less than a month. Um, and so, or I think it's been exactly a month actually, since the very first video I posted about Gaza. What is the reason I converted? It really was the connection to God that I feel every time I every time I read the Quran. Um, it's deeper. Each each holy book that I've I've read, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to anyone. This is just my own personal experience with reading holy books. As wonderful as I found them. As, as much as I dove into them, there was never really a connection to God when I've, when I've read them. It um, was sort of just more of an understanding of the humans that follow that religion, which is what I was seeking with Islam as well. I just wanted to understand the humans who were Muslim on a deeper level. Um, but just as I read, just the scientific facts in it, and uh, it, it just resonated with the beliefs I already had. That's that's what's most important. A lot of what the Quran teaches are uh, is our core beliefs that I already had within myself. So to just have that reflected back on onto me, and knowing that it came directly from God. That was a life-changing experience. Hi. Dallas, Texas, Malaysia, hello. Free Palestine, always. Oh, thank you for that. I remember how overwhelmed I was when I converted. Just know we love and support you. Oh, I love you guys too. Thank you very much for that. Um, what did somebody say? It was like a hijab question. Um, I'm getting to it. I think someone asked, do I wear my hijab in public? I think that was the question. Yes, I do. I pretty much, to be honest with you, even if I technically don't have to wear my, I mean, I do have to wear it right now as I'm live with you, but even though I technically don't have to wear my hijab at home when I'm alone, I still wear it. I take it off when I go to sleep. What am I studying for? Just Islam. Just to deepen my faith and, and better my understanding of my of my religion. Since I'm new, I, I really am taking it seriously and diving in. Share with us. 
Um, so right now I'm reading Muhammad, Peace Be Upon Him, The Greatest by um, um, Ahmed Didat. This one. Very short. Only about 60 pages, but it's very interesting to... Um, it's very interesting to see. Of course, it's bias, <laughs> as it would be. Um, and so it's written in a very biased perspective, but it's, it's cute. But um, it's it's very interesting, though, the the different historic like just texts throughout history of people outside of Islam speaking on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's It's a very interesting read so far, for sure. Did you tell, did I tell our Shahada or did I take my, my Shahada? Yep. Last week. What is the biased perspective? Meaning it's not written in more of like an objective way. Um, there, there are little personal anecdotes that are th throughout, like, of course, this is a stupid, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? like somebody's just uh, with like when he talks about opposing views, like that doesn't make any sense. You know, <laughs> like he's he he puts a lot of personal feelings into it. Like so, it's it's a very it's it's not written in more of an objective way. It's it's more of like a bias way, <laughs> which you know I have no issue with, but. Do I know about fertility? What do you mean? If you're talking about the stages, if you're talking about the stages of like the fetus and, and everything like that, yeah, I, I learned about that. That was actually one of the things that I, that really impressed me because in science it wasn't, it said it had the stages of development in the Quran, but science didn't catch up till 1862. So I, I really found that interesting. How did I learn to wrap my hijab? I trial and error. <laughs> I just started not playing with it. Like I took it seriously, but I, I was just testing different ways to, to wrap it. Oh, thank you. Let me see. Do you know did I read the letter to America? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, I read it. <laughs> it wasn't, it, it, it didn't have this, this, the letter to America didn't have this shocking reaction for me that it did for everyone else. Because keep in mind, I've been an activist since I was 17 years old. So a lot of, a lot of the things that were in the letter I already knew because when, when you're an activist that's on the ground, meaning like when you're marching, when you're meeting House of Representatives senators, when you're visiting their office staff and their offices, when you're when you are talking with other older activists that have been in the game for years and years and years, you just pick pick these things up. You learn about them. And not to mention, um, I recently posted a, a video about it, but back when when 911 happened there was this documentary that was released online um the website was called loosechange.com and the loose change documentary was very um damning for america as far as america's role or the united states role in 911 and so and and also if you've ever read i am malala um, that book also goes into, uh, Mal uh, Malala goes into just the different terrorist groups around the world that the United States had a hand in creating. And so it, it's not a seek. None of that is actually like a secret. 
it's it's been documented and it's it, it the information is out there i think the reason why it's so groundbreaking for americans is because we're we are quite literally fed propaganda from the very beginning like when when we go into when we start school like from kindergarten we start to get fed propaganda when it comes to the united states so for instance um george washington was a slave owner george washington was not a good person at all but when we were in school all we learned was that george washington chopped down a cherry tree when he was younger um he was the first president of the united states and he had wooden teeth it wasn't until i was a full-grown adult that i found out that he did not have wooden teeth he had teeth that were made from the teeth of enslaved Africans like they were or enslaved people they knocked out the enslaved people's teeth to make him dentures and so it's that sort of thing like history is so twisted when we're in school in America um, that it, it, it you, you quite literally have to go through years and years and years of unlearning because they indoctrinate us with false information, just complete lies. And so that's what's, I think that's why um, the letter is like, has that sort of effect on Americans who have been indoctrinated and now they're waking up for the very first time. I think that's that's why the, the letter has gone so viral. But there's, yeah, for me, when I read it, I was like, yeah, <laughs> like this is, this is, said Megan as a convert do you still support LGBTQ thank you um, a lot of y'all are not gonna like my answer absolutely when I reverted God did not place hate in my heart for anyone um, and that's <laughs> that's 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 simply that that's that's the answer to that um, I'm still at, you know, as I'm reading the Quran and, and everything and as, as I'm processing the information, um, I still think that that aspect of the Quran of people reading that, that, um, homosexuality is wrong. I think that that part of the Quran and keep in mind, I'm still learning, but I think that that part of the Quran is drastically drastically not not like misunderstood but the focus is in the wrong place where that comes up in my opinion um like it's the story of lot is when it, it comes up it's the story of lot how the men come come in and tell lot you can't you should know by now you can't protect anyone from us and Lot then says, your, your men who go after men, you're surely transgressors. But people completely skip over the fact that these men were in Lot's house to SA the angels that were there. They completely gloss over the fact that these men were predators. So, and they go straight to the fact that, oh, you hear what Lot said? So, so I still don't, um, just from my own study, I still don't agree with that mindset that a lot of people, that a lot of people believe, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I don't know why I say if that makes sense. It makes sense, but. Um, what chapter am I at in the Quran? I'll have to look to see where my bookmark is, but I'm almost done. I, I keep getting interrupted, like, with just all the various life. Um, I try to really prioritize it. 
and I was supposed to be done last week. Like I was really supposed to sit down and be done. But thankfully I have like a flight because for those who don't know, um, Dr. Um, Haifa Yunus, I'm going to be speaking at a uh, women's conference that she's going to be at in California, in Ir Irvine, California. Um, and that's this Saturday. So thankfully, I'll have the time on the plane where I can't be on my phone because I'll be in airplane mode. <laughs> so I, I will have to, like, you know, I will have that time to dedicate to, to reading the Quran. And it's not as if it's a rush. I, I still want to read for understanding, not necessarily to finish it in a fast amount of time. I want to make sure that I'm reading for understanding. Do I know Dr. Zakir Naik? Yes. And a lot of you are huge fans of him. <laughs> People ask me if I know him all the time. I, I, um, he was one of the first uh, scholars that I looked up, actually. What's my ethnicity? I'm biracial, actually. My, um, my dad was black, African-American, and my mom is white. Can it be live streamed? I'm not, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, I'll look into it. I'm not sure if it's just in person or I didn't see anything for virtual. So I'll, I'll look into it though. It was a very last minute type thing. Why do people ask about ethnicity? I'm genuinely confused. Some people are just curious. I don't really hold it against them. What are my parents' reaction? My mother was very supportive and proud. My father passed away when I was 18. So it's just my mom. Um, do I plan on changing my name? No, I will, I will be staying as Megan. How old am I? I'm 34 years old. Well, thank you. What is the meaning of my name? Um, it's Welsh, I believe. Uh, and it means pearl and great. It's really precious. How is Islamophobia around me lately? Are, are you safe? Thank you for asking. I have not received any issues so far and I have been out pretty much every day. Um, I haven't gotten any dirty looks, but keep in mind, I think that a lot of people who see um, hijabis are typically, the, the Islamophobic folks are typically cowards and go for like the smaller women. Um, I'm, I'm almost six foot tall. <laughs> so that helps, I think, uh, um, in, in me not receiving any kind of issues. So, and for those who don't use the American like measuring system, I, I'm, I think 180 centimeters. So. Someone said, really? Yeah. <laughs> you guys want to see? I'm wearing like more of the workout pants. So forgive my, keep in mind I'm lounging at home. So forget the lack of modesty, but so my ceilings are nine feet. My ceilings are nine feet tall. 
So, you know. If I'm on my tippy toes, I can touch my ceiling. <laughs> yeah. I'm tall. <laughs> Got it from my mom's side of the family. My mom is 5'9", um, but my uncles, so my grandfather was 6'4", one of my uncles is 6'5", and my other uncle is 6'9". <laughs> so, definitely get my height from my mom's side. My brothers are tall too, but... Amani says I'm six foot two. <laughs> yeah, you're you're then you're a little taller than me. I'm like five eleven and a half ish. But <laughs> what's the angel's beef with Lot's wife? Ooh, I found that out. I found that out. So I was on live with um, a Bostani and I asked him that question. I said, what are the angels beef with Lot's wife? Or what did, what did, what did Lot's wife do so horribly <laughs> that the angels have so much beef with her? Apparently the sin of Lot's wife was that she was the whistleblower. So whenever Lot, keep in mind, the people of the of the town or whatever were predators like they would SA people and Lot's wife would tell them whenever Lot had visitors like she would go out and say hey there's some good looking visitors she was like an accomplice of SA so the beef is the beef is justified <laughs> she is in the fire <laughs> She is in the fire, for sure. I'm sharing, <laughs> I'm sharing stories of the Quran like it's tea, because it is. It absolutely is. It's just so fascinating. It's so fascinating. Look up I'm Ahmed Didat on YouTube. I do plan on, after, I'm, after I finish this book, I do plan on looking him up, because I'm, I'm curious as to what his personality is like because <laughs> in this book his personality is kind of like very uh abrupt <laughs> you know <laughs> what advice do i have for i want to ask an innocent question did your husband revert and do you have kids i do not have kids and my husband did not revert we are separated actually <laughs> so that's that. Have I tried praying yet? Yes. <laughs> I have attempted praying. Um, well, I mean, I pray every day, like the, the way I usually pray or the, the way I'm used to praying, I pray every day. But as far as like the um, five prayers, I have attempted. You could pray, you could like do your own prayer throughout the day, of course. And I've, I, of course, do that in, in in English and in, in my own with my own heart, you know, but um, right now, as I'm learning the other five prayers in Arabic, um, there's just that disconnect because I, I don't know the language yet. Divorced because I converted? No. <laughs> Good question. No, it wasn't as if I reverted to Islam and he was like, I want to divorce. <laughs> no, this, this has been like a long process, a long time coming. Um, I do have a, a, that's the app that I use is Athan. But the thing is, I always like miss it. You like, you have to be right on time with Athan in order to be able to, you know, partake in its benefits um whereas I, I i might be like a couple minutes late or i might not like you know get to to my mat in time so but yeah am 
Am I happy that I'm a Muslim? Yes, of course. It's an honor. Still difficult to wake up? It always will be. <laughs> For Fajr, it always will be difficult to wake up. I, I have to make up Fajr like nearly every day so far because it like my body can't like it, it just is not it, it's not working. I was successful in waking up for Fajid once. <laughs> One time I was successful for waking up uh, to, uh, for Fajid. So far. I know I'm doing it to myself because I always go to bed late. I need to go to bed early. I need to go to bed at like 9 p.m. in order to get be fully rested for Fajid. But I'm a night owl. What can I say? Have I prayed in congregation before? The feeling is peaceful. Not yet. That is soon to come, though. I will be visiting the Mecca Center here in Chicago when I get back from visiting family. And so I'll, I'll be able to pray with the congregation soon. What time is Fajr here? It's like, I've seen it as early as like 4.50 a.m. and or like up to 5.19 a.m. It's been, it's been rough. It's been rough. Just wake up for 10 minutes and go back to sleep. That's the thing, I can't go back to sleep after I wake up. So I drag throughout the entire day. And I have to drink coffee and my, my body doesn't handle caffeine very well. So my hands are like this all day after I drink coffee. You have a baya, like the, the, like the prayer um, rope? I do. I was gifted one. By one of, it was so sweet. I was gifted, so, um, when I went to Furkan Bookstore, uh, someone from the book club who lives here in, in Illinois knew, knew the owners and said, I'll go with you. And so um, he and his little sister accompanied me and they were so sweet. They gave me like, they got me like a new prayer mat and um, they got me, ooh, you know what they got me? I haven't worn it yet. I've been, I've been, I've been, oh, I'm so excited. And it smells so good. I don't know what detergent they used, but like everything that they gave me smelled so good. I don't know what it is, but uh, I tried it and it changed my whole life. <laughs> It changed my entire life. I was just like, they were like, I wish we would have gotten it on video because I literally took a bite and I just stared at it. And, and I just was like, <laughs> like it was, it was, I don't know what sound I was making, but it was just, it hit different. It hit different. That shawarma. So if y'all ever, if y'all are ever in Illinois, it's in um, Bridgeview. Uh, they call it little pal. Uh, they call it little Palestine. It's called Babasage. The best. Uh, it's it's top five best food I've ever had ever in my life, and that's saying something. I've had a lot of good food in my life. <laughs> what part of Illinois do I live in? I live in Chicago. Don't ask which part. Nice try. <laughs> Not giving that info away, but. <laughs> Did I find a husband yet? Like five years ago and we're on our way out. <laughs> My next husband will probably be probably be Arab, to be honest. <laughs> the way things are looking. <laughs> it's 
probably what's gonna happen. <laughs> Netherlands. That's one of the first Netherlands I got. Hello. Australia. Oh, I love it. Dubai. So you're rich. <laughs> I'm just like. Do I have a cat? Oh, you hear? You hear Mufasa in the background announcing that he just pooped? He announces it to the whole house. Those are my kids. Those are the kids I have. Or I have two cats, Mufasa and Boots. Boots. Yeah. Come here. Meet the peoples. Meet the people's boots, boots. This is boots. <laughs> He's annoyed. <laughs> Do you see his face? If cats can run, like, he rolled his eyes at me. But he's adorable. And he's named Boots because he has little white boots. He's like little white paws. Yeah, show me your paws. He's so annoying. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Fuss fuss. You want to meet the peoples? What was it? You want to meet the peoples? Come here. Oh, you're heavier. Oh, this is a... So Mufasa is my ginger cat. He's the ginger of the family. The orange tabby. It's fast, fast. Mm. But yeah. Someone said stay away from Arab men. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I just have two cats. I'm not a cat lady yet. I know when I'm when I'm older. Anytime I see a black cat, I'm this close to snatching it up. Like anytime I see a black cat in the street. I'm this close to snatching it up. I love black cats, but I've remained strong. It's still two. Am I excited for Ramadan? I am. I am. So um, at first I was... <laughs> at first, um, I was excited. Excited because I fast every day or try to it in any way. These past couple weeks have not been good, so I've just been eating whenever I want. Um, but usually I, I fast every day and only eat between the hours of like 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. And I only have like one meal a day. With all the nutrients and everything, it's not like I'm starving myself or anything. But so I thought I would be ready for, for Ramadan. Like, oh yeah, that's going to be easy. Then when I said it in the book club, like, I'm ready for Ramadan, like, I'm excited. Everybody was like, oh, so, so you fast every day without water? And I was like, no, of course I have water. I guzzle down water. I have so much water. They're just like, you know, you're not going to have water either. And I was just like, what do you mean? I'm not ready for it. But when I was at Loyola University, like the young Muslim students there, uh, we had, uh, they invited me to a meeting that they, that they were having where they were talking about Aisha. Such a, such a good time. And I was like, when do y'all sleep? And they were like, oh, we don't sleep during Ramadan. I'm like, I don't, do it. I don't, I don't know when I get sleep. It's just does that. And so I was like, like, they seemed very passionate and excited and like could not wait for it. But I was telling them, I was like, I am 34 years old. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> I'm going to get my sleep. <laughs> Y'all could stay out till 2 a.m. You could you could do that all you want. If I'm without water all day, you best believe. <laughs> you best believe when that when that fast breaks, I am grubbing. I I am stuffing my face and I am guzzling down a gallon of water <laughs> and going to sleep. <laughs> Uh, 
Am I going to read the Prophet Muhammad? Peace be upon him. What was that? I missed it. I'm sorry. I prayed God to have children in Ramadan 18 years ago. God listened to my prayer. Oh, alhamdulillah. Oh, thank you, Asma Allah Hosni. Thank you. Mashallah. So fasting, I do fasting with water. I do have down like I could fast with water for 72 three days without any food like that. It does not hunger is not the issue. What is going to be difficult is the thirst. I, I am serious about my water. <laughs> I'm serious about my water. Malaikum salam. Because someone said, uh, yes, the thirst, the hunger is much more challenging. It, it, because, or the thirst is much more challenging. Yeah, because after you go without food for like more than a 24 hour period, you're, you stop being hungry. It's true. Like one after one to two days, if you have gone without food, your body turns off hunger completely. And you're just not hungry anymore. Whereas thirst, you can't, you absolutely can't go even a full 24 hours without drinking something. Your body will lose. I, I tried going 24 hours without even drinking water and just doing a full fast. I almost lost my mind. I, I had to break it for water. I had to break it. When we break our fast, we usually feel so full after three bites and a glass of water. Yeah, I believe that. Love you from Jerusalem, Palestine. Oh my goodness. Love you too. Stay safe. Thinking about you, hon. Sunrise to sunset. See, that's what's going to save me because that actually doesn't seem very bad. Sunrise to sunset is what? About 12 hours? About 14 hours, something like that. Wait, how, how, how long is that in the spring? Sunrise is around like 6 a.m. Sunset's around like 7-ish. It's like 13 hours. That's not bad at all. That's not bad at all. train myself with three three gulps of water each day oh thank you Qatar um oh your name is in Arabic but thank you um so three gulps of water each day I can't y'all I just know myself <laughs> I know myself I could not handle that I could not handle just three gulps of water. Watermelon will help me. Oh, y'all, y'all are sweet. Watermelon will help me. Um, I have to stay away from water. There are certain certain fruits that I have to stay away from. Apparently, the sugar content in water or watermelon is is higher. I'm diabetic, so I can't have like the high sugar stuff. Do I always listen to my body and <laughs> completely avoid the high sugar stuff? Not always. I am sometimes 
bad in that department, but not not very much. I really try to take care of my health, especially considering like diabetes runs in my family and previous family members did not. Um, the illness that they got as a result was actually very difficult, so. Um, try to somebody said do I want advice during Ramadan try to move too much believe don't try to move too much is that what you mean I'd imagine like if you do all kinds of stuff around the house and everything you're going to get thirsty because you're exp expelling like sweat and everything listen i will lay in bed <laughs> like I will, i'll do whatever i have to do to get through i already told um i already told my boss like uh because when i was wearing the hijab i was uh she was just like oh good for you and everything and i was like I just want to let you know, don't make me mad during Ramadan <laughs> I just want to tell you that right now. Yeah, I have a nice boss. She's really cool. I am not going to say what I do for a living or where I work because... Y'all see what kind of work I do on this here app. I am an activist. <laughs> okay. I am an activist and I speak out about issues. That doesn't always coincide with job security. <laughs> TikTok, TikTok doesn't pay enough to, to be able to sustain living, <laughs> despite what, what some people may think. People think that once you reach a, a certain level of followers, you just automatically start making a lot. Of, and that's not the case. TikTok pays so poorly, <laughs> so poorly. You still need a full time job. The only people actually making money from TikTok like full time have millions and millions and millions and millions of followers. Like those are the uh, who's who's like a huge TikToker on here that has like several million followers. Like each of your videos have to reach in the several millions in order to make any money off of TikTok. Like enough to pay all your bills and everything and, and not have another job. That Charlie girl. Yeah, what's her name? The one that 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 does the tiny dances and people go for some reason go crazy for it and it's not it's not you know i'm not i'm not i'm not trying to be a hater i'm just saying like i, I never got it because they're just they're just like these tiny they just like are muted dances d'amelio that's right okay charlie d'amelio I, I don't see it's it's those tiktokers that have been around for like the longest time people go crazy over them I don't I, I don't get it. Maybe it's my age group. Maybe it's me being 34 years old where it just I don't understand it. But then again, they probably think the same thing about me. <laughs> like, girl, all you do is sit on your couch and talk. What do you mean? <laughs> Sister, advice for God's sake, delete all the clips without a hijab. No, thank you. But thank you for for your concern. But that woman was still very much me. And I don't want to delete who I was. The beauty that is showing prior was prior to my shahada. So... Uh, Ramadan is the month we use our time to read the Quran and Hadith. I do know that, like, reading the Quran in its entirety. That's why I'm trying to, 
I'm trying to really get it complete in English so that I know the contents of it so that I, I actually understand it and have the full understanding and I'm, and I'm able to process each surah um, because starting in, I want to start in January with really, really being able to read it in Arabic. I know that's, that might be impossible, like an impossible goal, <laughs> but um, inshallah, I, I, I am confident I can get there. I d you d uh, you don't know what to do. You DM me no response. I'm going to be honest with y'all. Now is the time to DM me because I had to clear, like I had to clear out all of my DMs because it was just flooded with like spam. And, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of DMs. Um, and so I had to just clear it all out. And so I, I tried to read as many as I could, but like it was quite literally impossible to read every, every single one. Cause it was in the way into the thousands. And a lot of them were outdated. Like a lot of them, like if I were to answer, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense. Cause it was like time sensitive stuff. So if you DM me now, um, I'll more than likely see it because now it's like a fresh slate. Um, I want to read the Quran, but I am gay. Is it any use? Yes, the Quran is for every the Quran is for everyone. Please don't let anyone tell you different. Here's the thing with with any religion. Keep in mind, human beings follow religion. Um, and human beings are flawed. Human beings will twist whatever they read to make you feel uncomfortable or to make you feel wrong, to make themselves feel better. The Quran is for everyone. Everyone. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter who you love. It doesn't matter. The, the Quran is for everyone. You are free to read it. For free, actually, like the like the Furkan Foundation. Um, I think the 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 link in my bio is if you like want to sponsor a box, like if you want if you want to like pay for a box for for the the Quran to go out for free to a, a bunch of people. But they that foundation actually does give out the Quran for free, the clear Quran, the the translation that I'm that I read. Um, so if you're non-Muslim and you are just curious and want to read it, you can go, you can absolutely read it for free. They'll send it to you for free. And there's apps. Yes. When I first started out, I, I will be honest. The physical book is a lot better for me personally, just because in the English translation, because what I'm about to say, if I didn't specify English translation, some people would be mad. But <laughs> I like to highlight and tab and and um, just have my own system for studying. So the physical book is works better for me that way. But the app that I used was like the Quran.com app prior to getting the physical copy. That's what I used. And that still has like highlighting capabilities and, and things like that. So I do recommend that. What's my new daily routine? Th that's why I don't have a set sleep schedule because it's all over the place. It's, I, I haven't been able to establish a routine yet because when I wake up, um, I try to catch up on prayer, but I try to sit down with my Quran for at least a few minutes before starting work, but I'll get email after email after email, DM after DM after DM. I'll get texts like my whole phone blows up with texts. So it's very difficult to establish a routine because I'm either doing this for this person, this for this person, or I have to follow up with this person. It's, it's just been very in this beginning stage of everything. It's been it's been pretty overwhelming. So I haven't been able, unfortunately, to set up a routine yet. Am I happy? I am happy. I'm very blessed. 
you don't have to wear the hijab at all times. I know I don't, but I, I do simply because I like it. <laughs> it's comfy. Like, it's comfy, cozy. It's like wearing... You know, it's it's like wearing a hoodie, you know, like like a, a nice soft hoodie, like over your sometimes when you just want to feel like comfort. Have you ever like watched a movie and you had the whole blanket over your like you like you put the whole blanket over your head and you just curl. That's what a hijab feels like 24 seven. So even if I don't have to wear it 24 seven, I do because it's just <laughs> comfy, cozy. Um, oh, thank you. What am I studying? So I made a video of all the books that I am working on, but did y'all want to see them? If you didn't see that video, I can show y'all now. All the books that I am. finish it but it's um uh, muhammad peace be upon him the greatest by ahmed didat um and then just like a just like a few other i needed a prayer mat i needed a prayer mat and they sell like the, that too and they sat me down or we 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 just sat down we were talking about Gaza. we were talking about everything under the sun but they were like so what are you looking for and I told them what I was looking for, and it was um, it was something that was very advanced. And they were like, "No, no, no, no!" Like when when you're first starting out, that 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 text is for scholars. Like because somebody had recommended it to me, they were like, "That text is for scholars. You you we you want to start out with so and so and so and so." And one of the founders of the the foundation, the person who. Um, there's a number that you call if you're a new revert and have questions. He's, he's the one that answers the phone and, and answers all the, all the questions. He single-handedly picked out these books for me to start with, which I th thought was so sweet. But um, so he got me the Muhammad, peace be upon him, the greatest. Then he got, uh, he picked out the collection of An Nawawi, 40 Hadith, the Prophet's Traditions. And I like it because oh, it's so tiny. I'm obsessed with this. It's so tiny. I haven't read it yet, but I'm just like, I can't wait because it's just, it's so tiny. I love tiny things. Um, and this is Quran Teachings Made Simple for Women, a Compact and Informative Guide. That's what it looks like. And this one goes over. Ooh, it's all in it's in color and pretty flowers and stuff. <gasps> like this is like the inside. It's like oh, it has all different kind of I didn't know that. Ooh. I love colors. Anyway, um this one talks about Ooh, anything from motherhood, divorce, the concept of intercession, being magnanimous. Satan's footsteps. Um, a good woman, inheritance, repentance, kindness to parent. Like it goes over pretty much like everything. In this little book, it's like thin. Um, matters related to fasting. So glad he got me this one because I'm going to be reading this one through. And this one has... Like it doesn't just go over like what you need to do to fast. It goes over um, the definition of siyam or fasting, ruling on fasting, the virtues of fasting, the benefits of fasting, etiquette and, and sunnah of fasting, what should be done during the, the great month of Ramadan, uh, some of the akam or the rulings on fasting, how the onset of Ramadan is determined, who is obliged to fast, travelers, the sick, the elderly, ania, the intention in fasting and when to start and stop fasting. So it's literally everything that has to do with fasting, which is very helpful. Then they got me a brief illustrated guide to the understanding of Islam. And this looks major. This looks very scientific. 
extremely oh it says yeah yeah this one is the one that has like science editors and everything but that's this one and the inside reads like a text like like a textbook like look at look at the inside of this look how how official that is like it goes over are those t the tectonic plates Oh, this is science, science. Is that a bozo? Um, And this one looks, I mean, it looks like a textbook. It even has like multiple choice questions. And oh, oh, Lord. Oh, this is like a study. This is like study, study. Is that math? Mm -mm, mm -mm. We'll, we'll get to that one last. That one will be last gonna go with that one last um this was actually recommended to me by someone in my book club um that said it was very helpful for them um and just reminding them they are already muslim but it just helps them stay on track and and it reminds um them to stay on track and it's like kind of like a work it has like worksheets in it and everything but this is called the Talimul Haq, the guidance of personal life according to um, Islam. That's what it looks like. I haven't dug into this yet, but it came recommended. So we'll see. It goes over the Masjid, Nafl Salah, Mazur, Salah of a sick person, death, Gusal, or Guhusal. Kafan, Masa'il, Jana Azab, Salah, Burial, Inheritance, Nikah, Nikah, Nikah. The H's is what gets me. Nik, Nik, Nikah, Walim, Talak, or Divorce, Idat, Virtues of Earning Halal, Harms of Earning Haram, Good business conduct, uh, riba, and in, or interest in working for someone or labor. So it goes over pretty much everything. And then this last one is Prophet Muhammad's peace, peace be upon him um, biography, abridgment of Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him biography by Imam um, Ibn Kathir. Kathir, this one. And so those are the book. And then I have the, the kids version broken up of like the clear Quran, the kids textbooks that, that help make it a bit easier. And then they also gave me a, I'm not going to touch it with my hands because it has the, the Arabic in it. It's a study Quran journal. Um, and I haven't cleaned my hands, so I'm not going to touch it. But it has, it looks like that. And it's hardbound and it's gorgeous. Um, but it has the English translation and the Arabic, which is going to be very helpful when I really start to study the Arabic portion. Um, yeah. And then I have a Spanish version of the Quran. That'll be helpful when I, because I am studying to, uh, I am studying Spanish or I, I want to be able to speak Spanish, if not fluently, conversationally within the next couple of years. So that will be nice practice to read the Quran in Spanish. And then these are the, the kid books that I was telling about, like the kid version of the books that they said would be really helpful in getting me to understand. So... And that's pretty much and then all the rest of my books. These are this is my haram bookshelf underneath. <laughs> this is the pre the, the pre shahada life. <laughs> the romance novel life. <laughs> oh 
I probably should not have my grandmother's Bible on that shelf. Let me let me go ahead and move that. I think I got I was putting it away like out of Mufasa's reach because Mufasa likes the little the charm on it. Oh Lord, let me put this on the. Well, now I don't know. Is it haram to put the Holy Bible on the same shelf as the Quran? Doesn't the Quran have to be the highest? It's not haram. It's fine. Okay, good. Because it's my Grammy's Bible. Like this, this was her most prized possession. She gave it. She gave it to me. Actually, that's when I knew she was going to pass. Unfortunately, we shared a room in her last days. We shared a room in her last days, um, and she had to go back to the hospital because she had renal failure, so her kidneys were failing. And she had to go back to the hospital for like dialysis and everything, but she put on, she left her Bible on my bed. That woman did not go anywhere without her Bible, anywhere. So when she left her Bible on my bed, I knew that that was like her goodbye. Like that was, that was her, her way of saying goodbye. And so I've taken it with me ever since. And when I open it, thank goodness it has like the, the little pouch, the, the zipper cover to it. Cause every time I open it, it still smells like her. Even years and years later, I, I, I lost her when I was 16. It was St. Patrick's day when I was 16. And, um, I had actually had a little spurt of faith um and i i did follow now the memories are coming back i did follow christianity for a very short period of time You know, just being able to, to, to smell her and just feel her there, feel, feel her presence there. But then a few months later, a few months after that, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. That was his mom, too. But my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer stage four. And for that whole other year, he was he like for for a year, he fought it. And he actually passed away like two days after what would have been my graduation. Of course, I didn't go to my graduation because uh, he was dying. <laughs> so... How did I get on this subject? The Bible. That's how I got it. Um, yeah, so these are the, this is the stack of books that I'm going to be studying for the next. I want to get these done because they're not bad. Like they're all very, they're all pretty much short. So I would like to finish them by the end of next week. Um, I think I could do it. I think because this one's going to be done tonight. And then I'm going to be going after the other short ones. Um, like on the plane and everything. Well, no, the Quran will be on the plane. But like when I land and everything like that. Please read here. Can you read them here? Sure. When did you when did you guys want to want me to start reading these with you? Did y'all mean now? <laughs> y'all meant now? <laughs> Well, all right. I don't know how long I'll be able to stay stay awake, but I'm already I'm going to start a new one fresh because I'm already like 28 pages out of like I'm already halfway through this one. So we'll save this one for later um, after I finish it. We will start by reading. Let's do. I'll give you all the choice. Should we do the Quran teachings made simple for women? Or, you know what? No, men, men are on the call. It's none of y'all business. <laughs> <laughs> That's just girls talk. That's for girls talk. 
Um, we will read a brief illustrated guide to understanding Islam, the sciencey one. Now, am I going to retain this information that being this late at night? I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> Okay, so it starts off right right off the bat. Chapter one is some evidence for the truth of Islam. Um, chapter two is some benefits of Islam. And then chapter three is general information on Islam. So it goes straight into some evidence, which I like. Um, so it starts with the preface. This book is a brief guide to understanding Islam. It consists of three chapters. The first chapter, some evidence for the truth of Islam answering some important questions which some people may ask. Is the Quran truly the literal word of God revealed by him? Is Muhammad, true, peace be upon him, truly a prophet sent by God? Is Islam truly a religion from God? In this chapter, six kinds of evidence are mentioned. Um, the scientific miracles in the Holy Quran this section discusses the illustrations, some recently discovered scientific facts mentioned in the Holy Quran, which was revealed 14 centuries ago. The great challenge to produce one chapter like the chapters of the Holy Quran. In the Quran, God challenged all human beings to produce a single chapter like the chapters of the Quran. Ever since the Quran was revealed 14 centuries ago, until this day, no one has been able to meet this challenge, even though the smallest chapter in the Quran, chapter 108, is only 10 words. Alhamdulillah. Biblical prophecies on the advent of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the prophet of Islam, or Islam, um, in this section some of the biblical prophecies on the advent of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are discussed. That's also a question. If I say prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the first time, do I seriously have to say it like after every, like every single time I say his name? Or is it like if, if, it's, if his name is mentioned multiple times, does the first one like cover it? Ooh, I see some mixed answers. I see some no's and yes. I'll let you fight over the haram of that in the comments. I'll just, I'll say it to just, you know, cover all bases. Um, the verses in the Quran that mention future events which later come to pass. The Quran mentioned future events which later came to pass, for example, the victory of the Romans over the Persians. Miracles performed by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Many miracles were performed by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, these miracles were witnessed by many people. The simple life of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, this clearly indicates that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not a false prophet who claimed prophethood to attain material gains, greatness, or power. From these six kinds of evidence, we conclude that the Quran must be the literal word of God revealed by him. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is truly a prophet sent by God, and Islam is, a truly, is truly a religion from God. If we would like to know if a religion is true or false, we should not depend on our emotions, feelings, or traditions. Rather, we should depend on our reason and intellect i agree i agree um when god sent the prophets he supported them with miracles and evidence which proved that they were truly prophets sent by god hence that the religion um they came with is true Ooh, there's a typo I always feel so smart when I find typos in like published books. I'm like, ooh, that editor didn't do their job. Not to be arrogant, but I'm just saying. It's always interesting when I find typos. But anyway, the second chapter, some benefits of Islam mentions some of the benefits that Islam provides for the individual, such as the door to eternal paradise, salvation from hellfire, 
real happiness and inner peace and forgiveness for all previous sins. The third chapter, General Information on Islam, provides general information on Islam, uh, corrects some misconceptions about, about it, and answers some commonly asked questions such as, what does Islam say about terrorism? Why is that a frequently asked question? I mean, I know why, but that's just so Islamophobic for people to even. What does Islam say about terrorism and what is the status of women in Islam? Chapter one, some evidence for the truth of Islam. God has supported his last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, with many miracles and much evidence which proves that he is a true prophet sent by God. Also, God has supported his last revealed book, the Holy Quran, with many miracles that prove that this Quran is the literal word of God revealed by him and that it is it was not authored by any human being. This chapter discusses some of this evidence. It's interesting that they mention that the book is not authored by, uh, by any human being because in this book, I didn't know this and I studied Christianity technically and Muhammad, peace be upon him, the greatest by Ahmed Didat. Um, I wasn't aware that St. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament in the Bible. I didn't know it was, I didn't know that. I had no idea. But that was that was interesting to find out. I was like, are you for real? So anyway, that was interesting. Uh, the scientific miracles in the Holy Quran. The Quran is the literal word of God which he revealed to his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through the angel uh, Gabriel or Jibril. Um, it was memorized by Muhammad, peace be upon him, who then dictated to his companions. They in turn memorized it, wrote it down, and reviewed it with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Moreover, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, reviewed the Quran with the angel uh, Gabriel once each year and twice in the last year of his life. From the time the Quran was revealed until this day, there has always been a huge number of Muslims who have memorized all the Quran letter by letter. Some of them have even been able to memorize all the Quran by the age of 10. Not one letter of the Quran has been changed over the centuries. The Quran, which was revealed 14 centuries ago, mentioned facts only recently discovered or proven by scientists. This proves without a doubt that the Quran must be the literal word of God, revealed by him and the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that the Quran was not offered by Muhammad, peace be upon him, or by any other human being. This also proves that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is truly a prophet sent by God. It is be it seems to be a bit re repetitive like saying the same things over and over does anybody else anybody else feel that way um it is beyond reason that any anyone 1400 years ago would have known these facts discovered or proven only recently with advanced equipment and sophisticated scientific methods some examples follow the Quran on the human embryonic development. In the Holy Quran, God speaks about the stages of man's embryonic development. We created man from an ex extract of clay. Then we made him as a drop in a place of settlement or sperm drop, if you're reading the clear Quran uh, translation, firmly fixed. Then we made the drop into an alaka, leech, suspended thing, blood clot, uh, then <laughs> a leech is right Lord Lord you know how the you know how the, those babies suck up the mom's nutrients like a like a leech those babies like I swear they got they got a hold um then we made the alaka into a Mudgaha. Mudgaha. Or a chewed substance. This is why I prefer the clear put on translation. Because what do they mean? A chewed substance. In the clear put on, it was like. 
Hold on, who was that? Who was that? You thought you were slick. Free hostages, 40 baby, mm-hmm. I knew it. Y'all always try to, they try to make it in when I'm looking away. Okay. Um, in the in the cleared Quran translation, the chewed substance is translated more into like fetus, like like a. It's it's far easier to understand <laughs> if you're if you're new to Islam, I should say. If you are born Muslim, you this, and you've read the Quran over and over and over again, you might not need that additional clarification, but. Literally, the Arabic word alaqa has three meanings, leech, suspended thing, and blood clot. In comparing a leech to an embryo in the alaqa stage, we find similarity between the two, as we can see in figure one, which is this one. Um, also, the embryo at this stage obtains nourishment from the blood of the mother, similar to the leech which feeds on the blood of others. The second meaning of the word alaqa is suspended thing. This is what we can see in figures two and three, the suspension of the embryo during the alaqa stage in the womb of the mother. So that's two, figures two and three. One word has three meanings and all of them are correct. In any other reference or in any other place, a leech, a blood clot and a suspended thing would all be drastically different things. But when referring to the embryo, it's all correct with one single word. Um, okay, and then it just has the description of the, the figures. The third meaning of the word alaka is blood clot. We find that external appearance of the embryo in its sacs during the alaka stage is similar to that of a blood clot. This is due to the presence of relatively large amounts of blood present in the embryo during this stage. Also, see figure four, which is the, just showing just how much blood is present in the embryo. Also during this stage, the blood in the embryo does not circulate until the end of the third week. So it quite literally is a clot because it's not, it doesn't have any sort of system going. Um, thus, the embryo at this stage is like a clot of blood. So I'm going to describe that I actually am going to read the description of this figure um, so that you know what's going on. Diagram of the primitive cardiovascular system in an embryo during the alaka stage. The external appearance of the embryo and its sacs is similar to that of a blood clot due to the presence of relatively large amounts of blood. Oh, it just repeats the same information, got it. So the three meanings of the word alakha correspond accurately to the descriptions of the embryo at the alakha stage. The next stage mentioned in the verse is the mudgaha stage. The Arabic word mudgaha 
means chewed substance. If one were to take a piece of gum and chew it in his or her mouth and then compare it with an embryo at the mudkaha stage, we would conclude that the embryo at the mudkaha stage is similar in appearance um, to a chewed substance. This is because of the somites at the back of the embryo that somewhat resemble teeth marks in the chewed substance. And that, it's true. Don't that look like a chewed piece of gum? Look at that. Interesting. How could Muhammad, peace be upon him, have possibly known all, uh, all this about 1400 years ago when scientists have only recently discovered this using advanced equipment and powerful microscopes, which did not exist, exist at that time? <laughs> not them actually putting a chewed piece of gum. <laughs> not them putting a chewed piece of gum for comparison. <laughs> Listen, y'all didn't have to do all that. <laughs> um, Ham and Leeuwenhoek were the first scientists to observe human sperm cells or spermatozoa. Uh, spermatozoa. See, I'm I'm so used to trying to read the Arabic versions now. I'm just, the English work. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Uh, spermatozoa using an improved microscope in 1677. More than a thousand years after Mohammed, peace be upon him. They mistakenly thought that the sperm cell contained a miniature perform... <laughs> That's cute. This is cute. They mistakenly thought that the sperm cell contained a miniature performed or preformed human... Uh, human being that grew when it was deposited into the female genital tract. <laughs> How cute is that? So they thought in like the little the little sperm head was this tiny little human. <laughs> like you know those little dinosaurs that grow in water? That's what they thought. That That's the concept that they thought. They thought this little, once it enters the egg it just <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. Um Professor, I mean, it, it's understandable why they thought that, you know. Professor uh, Emeritus Keith L. Moore is one of the world's most prominent scientists in the fields of anatomy and embryology and is the author of the book entitled The Developing Human, which referenced work and was chosen by a special committee in the United States as the best book authored by one person. Dr. Keith Moore is a professor em emeritus of anatomy and cell biology at the Dean of Basic Sciences at the Faculty of Medicine and for eight years was the chairman of the Department of Anatomy. In 1984, he received the most distinguished award presented in the field of anatomy in Canada, the JCB Grant Award from the Canadian Association of An Anatomists. He was directed uh, he has directed many international associations, such as the Canadian and American Association of Anatomists and the Council of the Union of Biologi uh, Biological Sciences. In 1981, during the seventh medical conference in Dammam, Saudi Arabia, Professor Moore said, it has been a great pleasure for me to help clarify statements in the Quran about human development. It is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad from, peace be upon him, from God, because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad, peace be upon him, must have been a messenger of this. This was a scientist that said that. Consequently, Professor Moore was asked the following question. Does this mean that you believe that the Quran is the word of God? He replied, I find no difficulty in accepting this. During one conference, Professor Moore stated, because the staging of human embryos is complex, owing to the continuous process of change during development, it is proposed that a new system of classification could be developed using the terms mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, what Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, did, or approved of. Oh, that's what a Sunnah is, okay. Uh, the proposed system is simple, comprehensive, and conforms with present embryological knowledge. The intensive studies of the Quran and Hadith 
reliably or a hadith is reliably transmitted reports by the Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him companions of what he said, did, or approved of. In the last four years have revealed a system for classifying human embryos that is amazing since it was recorded in the 7th century AD, although Aristotle, the founder of the science of embryology, realized that chick embryos developed in stages from his studies of hens' eggs in the 4th century BC. He did not give any details about these stages, as far as it is known from the history of embryology. Little was known about the staging and classification of human embryos until the 20th century. For this reason, the descriptions of the human embryo in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the 7th century. The only reasonable conclusion is these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad from God. He could not have known such details because he was an illiterate man with absolutely no scientific training. The Quran on Mountains. A book entitled Earth is a basic reference textbook in many universities around the world. One of its two authors in prof is Professor Emeritus Frank Press. He was the science advisor to former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and for 12 years was the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Washington, D.C. His book says that mountains have underlying roots. These roots are deeply embedded in the ground. Thus, mountains have a shape like a peg. Um, this is how the Quran has described mountains. God has said in the Quran, have we not made the earth as a bed in the mountains as pegs? And that was in Surah 78, Ayat 6 to 7. Oh. What's going on? Hadiths are unreliable. Oh, y'all are going in. What book am I reading? I am reading A Brief Illustrated Guide to Understanding Islam. It's like the science-y portion of Islam. What got me interested in it. Or not got me interested in it. I got interested in it because the Palestinian people had unyielding faith. What got me like hooked on it, I should say hooked on the Quran. Um, Mufasa, you better not be in them clothes. Um, modern earth sciences have proven the mount that mountains have uh, deep roots under the surface of the ground. And that the, this is beep. Whoever edited this was asleep that day. I'll just tell you that. Um, have deep roots under the surface of the ground and that these roots can reach several times their elevations above the surface of the ground. So the most suitable word to describe mountains on the basis of this information is the word peg. Since most of a proper... Uh, most of a properly set peg hidden under the surface of the ground. So the most suitable word to describe mountains on the basis of this information is the word peg, comma. Since most of a properly set peg hidden under the surface of the ground. Okay, so I'm not crazy. That was poorly written. <laughs> that was, again... A failure on the other. Uh, mountains also play an important role in stabilizing the crust of the earth. They hinder the shaking of the earth. God has said in the Quran, and he has set firm mountains in the earth so that it would not shake with you. Likewise, the modern theory of plate tectonics holds that mountains work as stabilizers for the earth. This knowledge about the role of mountains as stabilizers for the earth has just begun to be understood in the framework of plate tectonics since the late 1960s. Could anyone during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, have known of the true shape of mountains? Could anyone imagine that the solid massive mountain, which he sees before him, actually extends deep into the earth and has a root, as scientists affirm? Modern geology has uh, confirmed the truth of the Quranic verses. What time is it now in the U.S.? It is what? One... 
It is 1.01 a.m. That's a cute monkey. It is 1.01 a.m. How did, didn't I just tell y'all it was 11.01? How did two hours pass? How did two hours pass? You know, Abel Stani was talking about this because someone asked him if it was the end of times and he said he thought so because of all of the signs that are happening. And one of the signs is that time goes by super ultra fast. Like a, a day feels like just hours and a week feels like a day and a, and a month feels like a week. Like it, it just goes by so fast. And listen, it, it literally felt like 10 minutes ago I told y'all it was 11. It, did, it does not feel like it has been two hours. Will I pray Fajr? I might have to repent <laughs> and make it up at the end of the day. There ain't no way I'm going to be waking up at, in four hours. My body won't do. And here's the thing. It's not that I deliberately don't wake up. My body won't. That's the thing. Like, no matter how many alarms there are, my body wakes up when it is good and ready. <laughs> like, to the point that I had to negotiate with my boss a flexible start start time it's not that i was late 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 but i had to establish a flexible start time because a i have pcos so pcos makes you tired all the time like makes you want to sleep all the time but also gives you insomnia so it keeps you awake even though you feel like you want to sleep for years but it it when i'm once i am asleep it's like a, it's like a coma sleep. Like it's, it's, it's a deep. My brothers even tested this one time. My brothers popped a, popped a balloon in my ear when I was asleep. Didn't hear it. Didn't wake up, didn't budge. Do you still live with your egg? Why y'all getting all personal? Why, why y'all want to know my, my, my personal, personal life? We were just reading about science. Why you all up in it? Why you want to know if my ex lives with me or not? Stop. You don't know me. Ooh. This next part, okay, I do want to read this. This is the last part I want to read, and then, and then it's time for bed, y'all. But I'm particularly fascinated with this, so I want to read it. The Quran on the origin of the universe. We getting into it. We getting into it. The science of modern cosmology, observational and theoretical, clearly indicates that at one point in time, the whole universe was nothing but a cloud of smoke, i.e. an opaque, highly, de highly dense and hot gaseous composition. This is one of the undisputed principles of standard modern cosmology. Scientists now observe new stars forming out of the remnants of that smoke. Um, the illuminating stars we see at night were just as was this editor, this editor has me clutching my pearls right now. How, how is this sentence? The illuminating stars we see at night were comma just as was the whole universe in that smoke. Okay. We're, we're back. That is correct. That is correct sentence. It's 101, y'all. Um, the illuminating stars we see at night were, just as was the whole universe, in that smoke material. God has said in the Quran, then he turned to the heaven when it was smoke. Because the earth and the heavens above, the sun, the moon, stars, planets, galaxies, etc., have been formed from this same smoke, 
we can conclude that the earth and the heavens were one connected entity. Then out of this homogeneous uh, smoke, they formed and separated from each other. God has said in the Quran, have not those who disbelieved known that the heavens and the earth were one connected entity, then we separated them. And that was Surah uh, 21, Ayah 30. Dr. Alfred Kroner is one of the world's renowned geologists. He is a professor of geology and the chairman of the Department of Geology in the Institute of Geosciences in Johannesburg or Johannes Gutenberg University in, in Mainz, Germany. He said, thinking where Muhammad came from, peace be upon him, I think it is almost impossible that he could have known about things like the common origin of the universe because scientists have only found out within the last few years with very complicated and advanced technological methods that this is the case. Also, he said, somebody who did not know something about nuclear physics 1400 years ago could not, I think, be in a position to find out from his own mind, for instance, that the earth and the heavens had the same origin. And we're going to end there. But I highly recommend, I mean, poor editing or no. Um, I highly recommend y'all, you know, you science nerds who want to pick up this book. I do wish the book was more objective. Like taking that. That's the thing. That's the thing. This the type of writing that is in this book in the other book that could that could be the deciding factor of whether or not people find it to be fact or opinion is when you include your own beliefs in it. Like in this book, when they said, this means they're like this, like when, it, let me try to find an example. Like how it says, if we would like to know if a religion is true or false, we should not depend on our emotions, feelings, or traditions which is true, you should look at it very objectively, but then it just goes on to say um, things like, surely there's, you know, there's no doubt that, that um, Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, was the messenger of God, but it says it out of, it sometimes says it out of context of the scientific fact, like it's completely outside of scientific fact, that's the thing that can that can make people think that it's more biased than factual. Whereas uh, most of this, if they just kept it within, like it's still perfectly fine that they say that, but within the context that it applies to rather than having it be a side note, if that makes sense. So that's something that I wish they worked on prior to the release of this because it is solid as far as the science aspect is concerned um they just need to to write it more object objectively with less with um less bias like they when you write a book like this you have to write it as if you don't already believe it you see what i'm saying you have to write it as if you are a person who is not of faith reading this book for the first time or else it just feels like or it just comes across to a non-believer or, or someone in another religion that's reading a book like this it just comes off as bias and a lot of the important information in here that is factual and is science backed can be overlooked because of it that's all I'm saying. So.
so I might not be on live for quite a long time, actually. I'll try to fit some some time in, but still. Um, love you guys. Thank you for joining me today or tonight, late, late night today for those of you who are on the other side of the world and it is now a new day for you. I am going to get some sleep. I doubt that I'll make Fajr, but I'm going to try. And I will see ever I wasn't talking to you. You scare me every day. And I will see everyone later. All right. Bye. Love you. Love you. Bye.